Good morning to those of you out there on the West Coast. Good afternoon to those of you here on the East Coast with me. I'm excited to get started on another training. Today is November 2nd for those of you here live. Um, and uh, just to recognize that we are, we're going to be talking about proposals. It's really important for me to give you training related to uh, being able to win more proposals. Let's go ahead and dive into today's training. And we're going to be talking about why your proposals are not winning. Um, and how to fix it, right? So inside the federal market, inside of federal agencies, your proposals might not be winning. I wanna talk about some of the reasons why and then how what we can do. And, and really, you know, this training comes down to a fundamental complaint I hear. And, and, and I've said in the past when I've had my own businesses, right? Losing sucks, it really does. And um, there's certain things, like if I go do a pickup basketball game, Losing on the court there, it's like, whatever, it's a quick little, I, I wasn't even playing basketball or thinking about playing basketball. I went, I did it. But in proposal writing, we spend all this time trying to capture and identifying opportunities, writing proposals, et cetera. And it can be really a bummer to be winning. Um, but the reality is you can be winning a lot. And, and um, absolutely, you can be winning contracts within the federal government that allows you to build your company. You should be able to win one out of four contracts that you put out there. One out of four proposals that you submit should be a winning proposal. And, um, you know, the reality is when you get good at this, you can be one out of three, right? In past companies, I was at a one out of three uh, level, and it's because we were super focused and super tight on what we proposed on. Um, but you can get to that stage for sure. I don't know where you're at. You think about where you're at, but most importantly, think about where you want to go. And keep in mind that the solution really is to just look at this process and begin to only write winning proposals. And I'll describe what winning means in a minute. But when you write winning proposals, you massively increase your chances for, you know, winning and to decrease losing. That's pretty much our goal, right? All right. And so today's training on this topic, I want to cover down on three main things. Uh, first thing I want to talk about is just some top reasons on why proposals aren't winning, why your proposals might not be winning. The second thing going from that is I want to talk about winning proposals and what's needed in a proposal for it to be considered a winning proposal. And then I'm going to wrap up with this idea that I really believe proposal managers should have early no bid, right? And I said bid, no bid, but really uh, what I want them to have is early no bid authority, this ability for a proposal manager to come so early in the process that they go, what are you doing? That's crazy. We want to stop that. So I'm going to end up with that. We'll talk about that. If you don't know who I am, my name is Neil McDonald. I want to welcome you to the GovCon Chamber of Commerce and... <laughs> I'm a little excited because our newsletter just hit 10,000 subscribers. I don't want to welcome you to, to the Chamber of Commerce. I want to welcome you to my federal sales training. I've been saying that for like three, 400 times in a row and I just forgot. Um, but welcome to my federal sales training where I provide tips every single day on how you can succeed in the federal market. I spent 20 years in the federal market as a small business owner. And since 2018, I've been teaching people like you that government contracting is not a secret. It's just a process. When we follow a process A to Z, we're going to have repeatable, predictable results. And that's the idea behind this training is to help your company and you start having repeatable, predictable results. Um, we are a self-funded organization. We don't take any money from the government. We're not affiliated with the government in any way. Um, I'm a small business owner who said, let me teach other people. And my team is behind me uh, helping it. So you can see my team in the, in the chat as well here. But I wanted to thank our sustaining members because Sustaining members are the ones who say, hey, we love what you're doing out there, GovCon Chamber of Commerce. We're going to sit there and become a sustaining member. There's a lot of value in there, but the main reason for becoming a sustaining member is support, making sure people from Guam to the U.S. Virgin Islands and everywhere in between have a chance at learning the how of government contracting. And so today I just want to shout out Mike Curry. He's um, a sustaining member. He's been a longtime fan of ours, uh, I think since almost 2018, 2019, when we were doing a lot of early activities. So thank you, Mike. Thank you to all our sustaining members. For everybody, do me a favor, in your uh, in the chat, put your company name, put your core competency, two or three words. Let buyers know who you are. Let me know who you are. And let others in the chat be able to um, see who you are and see if there's a reason for you know going offline and networking. And make sure everybody uh, connect. One tip I want to give people in the chat is don't just say, I'm open to connecting. I feel like a lot of us are saying that we're all open to connecting, but that's not how networking happens. Networking happens by you going back and looking at all the other people who said they're open to connecting and reaching out and saying, hi, hey, I saw you on the training. Don't sell anything, right? Don't do not do a, a data dump. Just reach out and say, I saw you on the training. Love to connect. Maybe we can talk in the future. That's more than enough to begin to engage with folks. And this is your community, right? So make sure you're engaging on the chat. Um, 
just giving you a heads up, we've got one more training this week. Tomorrow's Friday the 3rd, and the training is going to be how to be a preferred federal market IT government contractor. So you got a lot of IT companies out there in the GovCon space. How do you begin to raise your company's profile above your competitors, right? So I want to go down and teach you about that on uh, in the training tomorrow. Okay, so uh, let's begin with some top reasons on why proposals aren't winning, right? It's, it's not enough for us to just move forward and try to change process. First, we got to analyze where we're at. And when you talk to different people, you get different feedback from them. When you talk to a proposal writer, they might say something else. I'm giving you my advice on why proposals don't win from a sales perspective. I am a salesperson through and through. So uh, when you think about BD and capture, right? And, and not from a job standpoint, I've been doing sales in every market that you can think of. Um, and, the, and the point is proposals are just kind of the final step in a process but there's a lot of activities. But one of the reasons, um, and the reason I'm saying this is going with the first bullet here, right? Is that uh, one of the reasons I believe proposals aren't winning is that they're not compelling enough. Um, and compelling is this idea, you know, first off of making me want to read it. Uh, it might look like a mess, et cetera. There's, there's nothing compelling about this proposal. When I look at it, it just looks like every other proposal I've seen. And so when you begin to think about one way that you might make it a little bit more compelling, and I, and I wrote this in a uh, post that I did earlier this morning, is when you have a proposal, two, two things you might consider. One is, um, well, I'll just give you one tip. They say that a graphic or a picture is worth a thousand words, and sometimes we try to shove a thousand words in. What you want to do is to figure out how to, how to be compelling and how to be clear about um, the solutioning that you're trying to say. So use a graphic every two pages, really every page. And I know everybody will have a lot of different opinions, but my point is make it easy for people to visually see it. If you're on social media, if you understand anything about social media, you understand that really the idea of those of us who post is to stop the scroll. So as you're scrolling down, we wanna get you to stop. When you start trying to sell to your customers and um, use social media as a way to communicate, you want to stop the scroll. You want them to see something and go, whoa, let me stop and look at that. And that's kind of what compelling is. You're, this When they're reading through these papers and they've got a lot of proposals, what's stopping them in the track? Once you've stopped them, you move on to this next thing, which is um, proposals aren't winning because they're not persuasive. They're too compliant, right? I, I, I say this a lot as well. Don't make your proposals just about compliance. Everybody will write a compliant proposal. It's very rare that proposals will come in and you got 100 proposals and many of them are going to be not compliant. Most of them are really compliant. It's pretty easy to be compliant with shall statements and 12 point font or whatever, right? That's a compliance exercise and that is not persuasive. What you're trying to do is to persuade the customer that your solution is the best. Your thinking is the best. It's not just um, trying to state it and hope they believe it. And so one of the things that you can do when you're writing a proposal and you're, th and you're persuading them and you want to be persuasive is when you make a recommendation, give them some data and evidence that will back that up. Um, this idea that if I say, you know, hey, I know you wanted to go this way, we're recommending you uh, our solution and come in this way. When we do it, it not only will lower the cost a little bit, but more importantly, um, it will address the user adoption problem that tends to happen in projects like these. Um, users resist adopting this change. Well, if we go this way, and if you follow our recommendation, then you will be able to have not only a good project, but a uh, project that the users are really excited in adoption. So you're somehow trying to address um, this second tier type problem as a way to uh, persuade them. You're trying to persuade the reader that what you're saying is right. So don't just tell them because you could be totally right, right? Right, right? You know, you, you say, this is what I recommend you do. And that recommendation is absolutely correct. But if you don't give me any data and evidence, if you're not persuading me, guiding me along in that, then I'm going to go, well, that's not really what I was looking for. I was looking for this, right? You need to make sure you're opening my mind as a reader or the, the buyer's mind. The third reason on why proposals aren't winning is that they're uninformed. And fundamentally, what uninformed mean, means is that you're not doing capture, right? Too many of us get an opportunity we, he we hear about, even if we hear about it long in advance, we hear about it, we put it into our pipeline, whatever that is, and then we write a proposal at some point, right? Whether it's whether it's I hear about it today and I submit the proposal tomorrow, or I even go six months, the capture is not getting done. And when capture doesn't get done, 
you have no information. You're, you're writing a proposal from an uninformed state. The only way that you can be informed is to go talk to the customer. Capture is about getting in and talking to the customer or talking to people who can tell you about that opportunity. If all you do is look at an RFP and the documentation that comes with an RFP and write a response, there is you are uninformed. You're, you're, you're doing what everybody else does. And so you need to get in there and do capture um, to be able to talk to the customer. I'm actually going to dive into that a lot about what are some of the ways you can look at getting in and talking to the customer during capture. How do I get that information? In particular, what am I trying to get? And so the fourth one that I had here is another reason that I, this is my uh, my experience and most importantly, my belief is that I think another reason people are um, losing in proposals and why your proposals aren't winning with federal agencies is that you're focused too much on price. I've seen this many, many customers since I left my last company. It never occurred to me that people don't write proposals the way I do. I'm a subject matter expert and I was the focus of power, meaning I send out the proposal, right? And so when I got a uh, an, R, an opportunity and I'm going to look at it, the first thing I did was really kind of map out how we were going to do something, the solutioning, if you will, but really be looking at it from that perspective and what will it take? I didn't think of a, 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 as a basis of estimate, a BA, BAO or BOE or whatever it's called, right? I didn't think about it from that perspective. I didn't think about, hey, let's go look at the labor categories and all this pricing. And I believe sometimes people elevate pricing like that's the way we've got to think about writing our proposal. And to me, that's kind of the last thing you need to know. And this, again, could be a good debatable topic. But I'm saying you need to know what the work is, what it will take for you to get the work done and to do the best job for that customer and for their mission. Then apply the pricing to it. I've often seen people just go crazy about focusing on pricing and what's the competitive pricing going to be and blah, 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 blah. Well, if you had an informed proposal and it was persuasive and compelling, then you can convince the customer that a higher price is a better thing, right? So I'm not saying the price should be higher and I'm not saying it should be lower. I'm saying focus first on getting the mission done, really understanding how can I give the customer the results, the experience, the um, the you know the actual deliverable part that'll help them with the mission. How can I do that first then I'll focus on the price. Um, and then the next reason I have for uh, why proposals are not winning in the federal agencies is that the technical SME is not involved. And, and you have to think to yourself, how much is this your company? How much is this going on where you're at, right? If you're a small company, five and under, uh, it's a, really a different kind of a thing. But as you start getting bigger than five people, et cetera, when do you get that subject matter expert, that technical subject matter expert who can do the work, when do you get them involved? I, again, often see that it happens farther in the capture stage because people are worried about investing, you know, what they call BNP dollars, bid and proposal dollars uh, in there. But just like I'm saying in a minute that proposal managers should be involved earlier, I think solution people should be involved early on, like near the qualifying phase almost. Um, they don't have to spend a lot of time, 30 minutes here, and then you give them more time as you go along in the in the life cycle. But what I want is for the subject matter experts to come in and not write pages. That's where I find people are just constrained. Um, I teach people that you shouldn't use line paper. When you use line paper for note taking or, or brainstorm, things like that, you're constrained. Your thinking is constrained. Behind me, I've got a whiteboard. It's a 10 foot whiteboard, right? And I've got two sides to it. And I'm able to just let things out of my mind. And when you can get a technical subject matter expert in early, they can begin to start mapping out, oh, this is what it's going to take. This is what they'll need. And they don't have to be right about anything or, or, or proper. They don't have to worry about grammar. They don't have to worry about certain pages. Hey, here's the requirements. What do you think we would do to tackle this? And you just let them go and you let them go a few times. If you can get them engaged early on, then they're going to be able to really focus on the solutions. And ironically, then that price is a lot closer to the actual cost plus profit, right? Um, and the last thing that I put here on why we lose uh, and, and uh, this, you have to decide whether this fits for you, but often we're having um, our proposals lose when we send them to the federal agencies because we shouldn't have even have sent them. You know, if you really look at it honestly, you probably should have subcontracted instead of uh, primed. I have a, um, a tool that I use, it's, you know, and many of us in the industry use it. It's called the requirements gap analysis. And I use this early in the sales life cycle, right? This is different than a compliance matrix, which is 
like a proposal manager tool. This is a requirement gap analysis that I use between the qualifying and the pursue stage when I'm trying to say, is this truly an opportunity for us? And I list out the task areas, right? I'm not trying to do all this formality around shall. I'm going, what is in this opportunity? What are they looking for us to do? And then I score my ourselves, right? We score ourselves on this by saying a score of one through five, where are we? And the reason I'm telling you this is if I can't get a collective score of four or above, then I'm not priming it. Maybe there's some discussion between three and a half and four, right? But if it's three and a half and below, it's an automatic subcontracting. And so do you have tools like this in place that tell you whether you should prime or sub, right? Or are you winging it? And I say that softly, right? Because a lot of us even do that. We're like, uh, we could do this, but did you take the time to dig into the requirement? And it doesn't take a lot of time. This, these tasks, at most, it's eight total hours, but usually you can do it in an hour, right? A requirement gap analysis on a, a opportunity that's $10 million or less, that's an hour. It's not a lot of uh, work engaged. And then you match it to what you can do. And one other thing I do in the requirement gap analysis is I say, do I have three past performances on these task areas? If you don't, I don't have to wait till I get to the proposal manager to have a conversation about that. I can see early on, hey, I like this opportunity. I can cover down on, you know, 40% of the opportunities. Let me go find a prime and get on a team. That's an acceptable opportunity to be in the pipeline. Just know whether it should be subbing or priming. Okay, so let's um, talk about, uh, when I talk about um, winning proposals, I'm comparing it against this idea of P-wins. I did a training once in a post where I talk about uh, death to the P-win. And the reason I don't like a P-win, it stands for probability of winning, right? I don't like it for two main reasons. One, most people that I encounter just make it up. They don't actually have a calculation that the system tells you what the score is. The capture person is telling us what the score is. That's not good. It's like a, a project manager telling me the completion percentage of a project based on them filling the number in. It's like, no, it should be based on the work that is done. And the second reason I don't like it is because generally a P win, if it's probability of win, is the number of proposals submitted to the government is the P win, right? If there's four, my P win is 25%. How would it be 80% if there's four people in there, right? And so what I really like better is this term, a winning proposal score. The winning proposal score is saying the best our company can do, any company can do, is submit a winning proposal, a proposal that deserves to win. Who knows if it's going to win? That's a separate question, right? That's up to the government. But what's up to us is whether the proposal's got everything covered down. Um, I wrote here that buyers don't care what you know until they, until they know that you care. And the way that they can see that you care in your proposal is that you do a lot of the research that I'm kind of mentioning below. And so we'll talk about this. Uh, for a few minutes. So the idea of a winning proposal is aligning the proposal activity and the writing that has to be done with the capture. Uh, sometimes, again, I feel like the capture and proposal people don't talk until there's one little handoff. I'm like, what are you doing? Do DevOps where you, you overlap them and they kind of run in parallel. And in the beginning, the proposal manager and solution people have less energy or, or um, uh, they're, they're spending less time on a, an opportunity. And then it begins to increase while the capture goes down. And so when you think about a winning proposal, it begins with a core competency alignment, number one here. How much does this opportunity align to our core competency? This forces you to have to define what do we sell? What's our core competency? And then um, when I build capture tools for uh, our customers, we use this exact thing for winning proposal score. It calculates out in numbers um, how you know what score you have. And so core competency alignment, it would lay out um, do we have you know, two core competencies in this opportunity or three or, or four plus, right? And what you're looking at is if there's only one of the task areas that are in there, then we're not covering down on it. And so every one of these scores, by the way, uh, that I have here for PWIN, they each have four uh, choices you can choose. And um, the idea is if you choose, if you're um, you know, A through E, and, and if you have E, you have less score and there's really, you're not having a strong winning proposal. And if you have A, you get high points. And so an example is requirement understanding. The first thing is I understand requirements E, right? I understand requirements based on the PWS. It's like, cool, that's what everybody understands. And then I understand requirements because um, of an industry day or something like that. Uh, when you get to C and you're getting more points, right? You get more points, the more you know about something. And requirements understanding, um, I heard about it from the program office. The, the uh, fourth one or B, right, where you get second most points is when 
I've had conversations with the customer, with the program office about the requirements. The fifth one is where they're changing the PWS because of our conversations to include what we said. If I can get to that stage through conversations, that's capture. If I can get to that stage, I'm giving myself maximum amount of points, which is really influencing that proposal score, right? Um, I separate three and four out separately. So agency understanding, let's say this is the Navy and um, customer understanding, this might be PEO digital. And the reason I do that is if you want to really show the customer that you want to be part of their, their team, like the Navy, and you want, I want you to choose our solution, bring us on your team, et cetera. I not only understand um, the PEO digital's office and, and kind of their mission, what they're doing on IT, but I understand how it fits into the overall agency within nav war for the buying command or within the navy and how those tie together too many people i find they go right to the proposal and the customer in the program office but they ignore the higher commands why does anybody else even care not just about your opportunity your requirement but why do they even care about peo digital or the program office understanding that is a big deal and so there's ways that um i i describe how much value you have from agency understanding or customer understanding. So agency understanding is we've been, we have past performance in there. We've been doing some work, things like that, right? Customer understanding is that same kind of thing. We've been in there working with them or having meetings with them. Uh, those all begin to add up and you try to work on it. If I do a quick sidebar, this is why I tell people you need to subcontract, especially when you're trying to break into an agency, go get three or four subcontracts so that you learn that customer and you begin to have agency intimacy. You understand them deeply Plus, you can sit there and say, we got security clearances. Uh, we understand the documentation they use. The Navy, as an example, has a shore and a float type thing. If they have a software package, they want it here on, on land, but they also need it deployed out to their ships. How do you gain that experience? Generally, past performance is a great way to start. And now you're starting to have agency and customer understanding. Um, past performance is just coming in and saying, do we have one past performance or no past performance, one past performance, two past performances? Are these past performances in the agency? So you get more points. Remember E through A. Uh, to get to A, you really need three past performances. At least one is in the agency, right? That kind of a scoring system really helps me understand, is this proposal at a certain level? Are we going to be able to win on this? Um, and then that goes into teaming partners, right? Based on everything we knew before. Are we building a team that covers down on our weaknesses? Um, and so in there, that that um, those scores kind of go, have we evaluated the, the teaming partner potential, right? We don't just keep going back to a favorite, but do we really compare the need to the, uh, you know, potential teaming partners? And then um, do we have relationships in place? Do we have NDAs in place? Have we had uh, signed NDAs, right? Teaming, so many people leave it up to just reactionary approach. But it's not just a, a legal TA, but an understanding of, hey, this is what we need from you. And this is what we're going to give you. That, that thing with teaming partners is vital. And so understanding these and having these uh, I's and T's crossed will begin to keep increasing your proposal score. And then pricing and staffing, um, hopefully they come down to it. I just want to hit staffing before I hit the next slide. Um, staffing is this idea of, do I have an understanding of the total FTE count, right? How many employees are going to be needed to, to if I win that? Who are the key personnel that are required? Have I begun to track on that? I've seen people lose opportunities that are significant, 100 million plus. Um, at the very last minute, they have to abandon it, which is really a bad thing when you abandon late in the sales cycle. Um, they have to abandon it because they didn't track on certifications that were needed or something. And, um, and they just don't have the right staff ready to be able to start on day one if they win that contract. I used to coach volleyball and I would tell the team because I, you know, I one time, I one time saw the team get upset at the person who lost the last point. And if you don't understand volleyball, it's 20 plus points to win. So 20 plus points they lost before they had a losing point that ended the game. And what I told them was it's not the losing point. It's not that last point, but it's everything ahead of time. And it's that same thing. Sometimes I see companies or people blame the uh, proposal managers if a win doesn't happen. Oh, you know, the proposal managers wrote a poor proposal. You're right. You gave me three days to do it. Well, I had two other proposals. You didn't have any capture information and I lost it, right? <laughs> I feel for the proposal writers. And the point is you don't blame uh, volleyball players 
for the on the last point, you say the whole team, hey, we lost at every single point from the first point we lost to the last. It was a team loss and proposal writing and capture and sales. It's the same thing. It's a team win and it's a team loss. Nobody won it and nobody lost it. We won it. We lost it. And so I'm recommending that you push, um, really make a point of getting proposal managers involved early in the sales cycle. If you understand the sales cycle, right, at some point you're going through pursue and bid and then there's this proposal stage and that's where people are beginning to get the proposal managers involved. I'd like to recommend you get them involved very early on. This is a similar to the DevOps approach in software development. But when you get a proposal writer engaged in the sales cycle early on, they help us face reality. Plus, they begin to come along the journey. They're part of the entire journey. And so we sales and capture people also go to the end and we're part of the entire process. Um, just very quickly, because I'm watching the time here, right? Proposal managers, when you get them engaged early on, they'll be able to point out pretty quickly, this is not our core competency. Why are we even looking at this opportunity? If this is what we say we sell and this opportunity is here, why are we doing it? I have this rule that says, if anybody has to rationalize why an opportunity goes in the pipeline, it's not a good opportunity for the company. It's certainly not a slam dunk. Um, the second thing proposal writers will say to us is, look, we've never written this before. You're trying to put this opportunity in. And by the way, if we've never written this before, it's a pretty good chance it's not our core competency. But we've never written anything like this. I don't even, I wouldn't even know where to begin. And it's much better to get a proposal manager saying that early on, maybe influencing this no bid. No bidding is a really good thing to do early on. It is not a good thing to do, in my opinion, later and later and later, because the farther you wait to make that decision, the more you've spent on an opportunity or abandoning. But if you get early on into that, um, you're going to be able to uh, afford the no bids easier or abandoning the opportunities. Another thing, um, proposal managers will just know off the top of their head, they'll be able to point out, it's like, we got no past performance in this area. You know, we're, if we're going to prime this, we're going to have to have probably three past performances. Even if I don't see a draft RFP, I just kind of know that's going to happen. They'll be able to say these things to us pretty fast. They can look and spend, you know, 15 minutes, 30 minutes and go, you know what? There's some wiring things in here, like a certification that looks so unusual. I've never seen it before. And it's for a key person or something, or they got 20 key people. These are things that if you begin to look at, um, proposal managers can give us insight early on. And the last thing, and, and something that's really important is if the proposal manager is getting involved early on, they can go, look, we've got so many opportunities in here. There is no capture. You're basically saying, why don't we just write an opportunity blind, a blind proposal and hope we win. And, and hopefully all of you know this, hope is not a strategy. Here's what I want you to remember from today's training. I know it's kind of a fire hose. You can go back and watch the replay. But when you write proposals and you're um, driving forward, make sure you're being persuasive and compelling. Keep that in mind that that's what leads to wins is when you can persuade them um, to, to see your opportunity, your proposal as the right opportunity or the right um, response. Forget about the P win. Think about the winning proposal score. Think about putting in place those um, scores that I said. I have previous training where I actually laid out the scores and everything on a winning proposal. So take that into your pipeline and start having a more mature pipeline that will tell you whether a proposal is going to be a winning one. And then the last one, remember, capture, it's not an optional task. It's a mandatory task. Begin to figure out how to get it involved. Um, if you'd like my help on business development within the federal market, accelerating where you're going uh, within the federal market, especially maybe as it relates to the pipeline here, reach out on www.govconchamber.com and learn more about how we can help you, how my team and I can help you. For all of us, just remember, government contracting, it's not a secret, it's just a process. I'll see you in the next training.